Welcome everyone to the Bonner Institute for Purposeful Leadership's webinar series. And as you know, today, uh, the uh, founder of the Bonner Institute, James Bonner, is with us. And we are delighted to host some very distinguished people and experts on artisanal mining. And uh, those experts are Rob, Rob Carpati and Paul Clements Hunt. Uh, I'd like to just give a quick overview. Um, mining projects have outsized social and environmental impacts. And Rob and Paul are going to explore the integration of corporate purpose and strategy and mining from a stakeholder relationship perspective. And they're going to focus on specifically relationships with artisanal miners who cohabit land concessions associated with large mining projects. I believe there is so much substance in the topic that I've already invited Rob and Paul to present hopefully in the month of October. And Rob and Paul, I'm going to place myself on mute. I'd like to ask that you introduce yourselves and we can get started in our discussion. Uh, I will be an active participant, but I'm going to mute to prevent uh, background noise. We invite all participants at any time to submit questions via the chat feature, or uh, if you are so inclined, feel free to unmute and we just make it an interactive conversation. So Rob and Paul, again, delighted to have you with us and uh, eager to hear your uh, introductions of yourselves. Thank you so much, um, James, for, taking, uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk about this topic, which is, you know, it's evolving and it's uh, a little bit uh, invisible to a lot of people, the implications of artisanal mining around uh, governance. So first introducing myself, I'm finance by trade. I lived in the world of corporate finance for 30 or so years. And a few years ago, I flipped towards uh, responsible mining and artisanal mining in particular, aligning my focus in the values. And the reason I picked that as a focus area is because there's massive opportunities for impact. There are vulnerable communities. It's the basis of the entire economy. There are environmental touches. And it's essential to deliver minerals that are needed for the energy transition. So on all cylinders, the opportunity for both dignity and productivity are fundamental. Over to you, Paul. Uh, first of all, look, thanks to the Bonner Institute, to John and, and James for the kind invitation. Um, 100,000 foot uh, Formula One um, sort of description of who I am. Paul Clements Hunt, uh, split between Nairobi and um, London, lived out of the UK in, in Asia and in Africa and various other countries for the last 30 years. And my sole obsession, whether in my own businesses or 12 years as a UN diplomat um, from 2000 to 2012, was how do you mobilize capital and finance through public or private markets at scale to deal with some of our huge, complex, converging systemic risks, whether it's environmental, social, or governance. My team in the UN, we coined uh, ESG in 2004, and we launched something for Coffee and Anne called the Principles for Responsible Investment, now backed by 5,300 institutional investors and nominally $121 trillion. Are all the problems solved? No, we've got a lot of work to do. But look, I'm basically, my fundamental mission the last 30 years, including five startups, has been how how do we mobilize capital and finance through public and private markets to scale, which actually turn us to regenerative capitalism, not extractive? And um, I, my my intro to um, uh, the whole artisanal mining scene came from, I had the honor to chair something for a few years called SOS Sahel. For, so the countries from Senegal to Djibouti wasn't mining, it was food security, but I was introduced to some incredible artisanal uh, mining communities through that process in countries like Burkina, Chad, Mali, and that got me obsessed as well. Look, I'll leave it at that. I hope that's uh, uh, clear, but uh, it's a joy to be have been working with Rob the last few years on these issues. Can you provide more insight, please, into how you would not only mobilize capital, well, certainly one of the main ways that you would mobilize capital is you have an entity in which to invest that capital. Is the entity that you're talking about that would own a mine or conduct mining activities, would that entity be a mining company or a holding company? What is the type of structure that you would have that would organize those activities and the investment capital would go into 
and what would be the the corporate or business structure with the artisanal miners? Rob, do you want to have first chop, and then uh, I'll join on after you, or I can I can give it a shot. Yeah, I'll, I'll get started and then pass it over. So so context is everything, John. And at a starting point, artisanal mining's in eighty countries. There's forty five million uh, miners. It looks different place by place. It's a mirror of the socioeconomic reality on the ground. It's largely informal today, so done by onesies, twosies, without stable, predictable business relationships. So when you talk about investment access, what do you need? You need clear, clear legal frameworks so that there's a basis to do business in a country. And in a lot of countries, that's inconsistent today. There, there are choices made around whether ASM is legal or not, what it looks like. But these are folks who are natural extensions of communities. They, they've been doing this since time immemorial. So naturally, there needs to be an appropriate legal fit. Along with that, there need to be appropriate standards. What does responsible ASM look like? So, so, so whether it's equipment, whether it's safety, whether it's mercury, whether it's the value chain, human rights, of course, which you've got to lead with. So the UN, there's a UN Mining 2030 uh, Investor Commission that's instrumentally doing work right now, led by Adam Matthews, that's focused on both large scale as well as artisanal mining standards. So once you've got standards, once you've got legal frameworks, you're cooking with gas as far as being able to engage in dry financing, set up an investment marketplace. As you do that, you need to start formalizing miners. In other words, turning them from onesies, twosies into cooperatives or associations. So you've got a thousand miners, 1500, 2000, instead of three. Once you do that, you can, you can engage the value chain, suppliers, customers, build stable uh, business processes that are predictable. And as you do that, all of a sudden you have a basis to engage investment. So the work that Paul and I have been focused on is all around what does that look like in catalyzing the upfront uh, development and delivery of that. Paul? Look, I'm going to be the bad cop. I mean, we, we're, not, we're talking about a, a, a value chain. And I mean, I'm talking about from large scale mining right down through past ASM into the illegal mining. It's mucky. It's opaque. There's huge amounts of mafiosa involvement. There's organized crime. But at the heart of all of it, there are um, dependent communities. And whether that's dependent communities co connected with illegal mines or more formalized ones, we, we the 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 chain is complex and difficult and at the moment in terms of artisanal mining i think there has been a fracturing of the relationships for many decades down the chain between large miners and smaller miners and artisanal miners and i think there are false narratives and some of those narratives need to be broken and remade about who we're dealing with and i, I would say at the moment, as it stands and our focus has been, how do you make not the mining component investable? How do you make the communities investable and cohesive? And you cannot differentiate, I don't think, the the families and dependents and the mining processes, whatever scale they are, you cannot deconnect them. It's all part of the same ecosystem. That makes it complex. Let me just finish that with one thought. Um, in terms of the 45 million miners and the 220 plus dependents, we know in the least developed countries, the least, the, the 46, and whether this is in Africa, uh, whether it's in LATAM or it's in Asia. Uh, or, or other parts of the world, you, you, you've you got families who exist on a sort of combination of, yes, mining might be front and center, but they're also farmers and they're also fishing people and they also depend upon foraging and they depend upon forestry, right? So it it's a complex ecosystem. To get to the point of investability, I think there are, and we'll unpack these, some fantastic developments underway at the moment, trying to deal with a really complex and involved problem at the really deep dark mucky end there is hugely organized criminal networks that control chunks of the mining and that deconnect and that understanding of the complex chain is really important because we'll never get to investability before we begin to as rob said formalize 
regularize, smarten up, and dealing with, you know, many different agencies to to address the problem. Sorry, I'm I'm going on a bit, but look, it is complex, and lots of solutions have been offered and proffered and fallen by the wayside. We think we're onto something different without being arrogant. So, do you have today a case study of uh, that you would uh, argue is an example of a successful? Uh, effort, successful organization that has matured and you are learning lessons from it, the organization of the entity, organization of the entire value chain, chain, orchestration under one corporate purpose of the entire value chain, and you're able to eliminate or mitigate some of the criminal activity. Um, I'm just curious, do you, is it still a vision or is there a reality somewhere that is a demonstration of success? There, there are realities, and, and we need to learn from those realities, and we are learning from those realities. The first point is the complexity that Paul described and the realities within that complexity that go from, from ugly to organic mean that the full value chain needs to be considered. You can't look at a mine. you got to start with the community, like Paul said, but look at what are the inputs into that community and where does that product flow? So the full value chain. Obviously that looks different if there's illegal mining versus more traditional artisanal mining. So there are examples, both companies and, um, and, and specific projects that are successful in moving the bar. And what's in common with those? Well, number one, they're looking at the full value chain. They're not trying to pluck themselves in and um, saying, here's the answer. Number two, they're, they're, they're engaging the folks on the ground and the reality on the ground is a starting point for solution design. Because at the end of the day, you can't impose solutions. Solutions need to reflect the beliefs, values, culture, history that's in a particular place. It's going to be different in the DRC than what it looks like in Colombia because the history and the culture are different. And, and, and along with those things, it's going to take time and a village worth of capabilities. Because at the end of the day, formalization isn't a few lawyers coming in or a few mining professionals or a few um, communications people. It's bringing this broad-based change around how business is conducted and how it fits culturally within the realities of uh, the location. So, so, so examples around that, of course, we've tried to fully bake in and learn from so that we can hit the ground the right way. And I'll add two just, there will be generic examples, but they are actual examples for reasons of confidentiality in terms of some of the partners involved. Um, so the first example is, let's say it's a West African country. There's a prominent person there from actually, a, you know, a, a, an original cultural perspective who has aggregated 2,000 um, informal uh, gold miners, primarily gold. And there are conversations ongoing now between that aggregation and volumes required in terms of, you know, investors coming in and look at the market. Um, so there's co really deep and interesting conversations going on from actors, and it involves both the the end industrial or brand users of gold. It involves European governments and specialist European investors in terms of, okay, how do we, for reasons of liability and exposure of the end industrial users of gold, think gold watches, think gold jewelry, how do we begin to create the provenance into this particular um, space, which is, which is protected and sound? So you've got an agglomeration of both the producers themselves, an aggregator, investment, refineries in Europe, governments who are concerned or a government who's concerned and i think those conversations are really quite positive and it pivots around a really novel investment um uh, which uh, investment structure which has been piloted for uh debt investment into either a mine or aggregated mining capability um 
which is which is a you know a bona fide investable structure uh, passed by the regulator in the given country. I'm sorry it's so generic, but I, I as I said, there's confidentiality around it. Second example would be um, within the context of let's say the uh, the former Malian gold empire which as you know stretched across the sahel mali chad burkina faso there are similar conversations ongoing with um should we say descendants you know of the people who own the mines and it ranges from artisanal informal through to medium and and quite large mines again the same issues around the transparency and provenance of the gold the ability to ke- connect mines directly to refineries without you know gold at the end of the day is ultimately fungible once it arrives in certain markets you can not trace the 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 the, the um the the um the provenance so I, i'm sorry those are generic examples but in terms of piloting structures sensible political conversations and deep concern by people, large companies exposed to the, the the. I always say there are lots of companies don't want to be the 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 the, the blood gold equivalent of of blood diamonds. But that dynamic is happening, and and there's also discussions at multilateral level. Rob, I I have left it generic, but um, I think there's some really really healthy discussions going, which are beginning to understand the the depth and nature of the problems. Well, there, there absolutely is. And when you think about the context of this conversation, it's about governance. It's about how, to, how the large companies and small companies and, and small artisanal miners collaborate. How do you track and trace from miner to refiner? How do you ensure that conflict risks, legal risks, PR risks, reputation risks and so on are managed for success for um for 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 the broad-based value chain and as you do that how do you make sure there's positive impact on the community because if you don't do that you got nothing And, and and that's the point in too many places what we've got today boils down to shades of conflict and as we think about formalization and extending the circle around it, conflicts replaced by collaboration and lack of dignity by dignity and productivity, which is shared downstream. And if I can just add to that as a footnote, look, I think there was a stake in the ground that um, was was put into place uh, by, and, and sadly, we, we lost him a couple of years ago, but Professor John Ruggie, who was um, central to the development of the you know, human rights and the guidelines on multinationals and, and those sorts of things and worked as a key advisor to Kofi Annan for many years and for many mm-hmm. decades behind that. And, you know, his starting point was in terms of these types of development challenges that the human rights component at the very, at the very heart of whether it's mining or any other op- operations in, in least developed countries, you had to start from the standpoint of human rights and dignity. Now, it might sound soft and a little bit policy wonk, but the more you unpeel it and the more you look at it, I think that the you know the 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 stake placed in the ground by John Ruggie through his work with the UN, but you know with businesses around the world, was an in- incredibly strong anchor for how to approach this issue start with human rights and build from there uh, how do you spell john ruggie his last name so it's professor john ruggie r-u-g-g-i-e and um he was uh, as i say he was an advisor to uh, the late secretary general Kofi Annan. john passed away I, I think a couple of years ago and um you know but his work around the oecd guidelines was was remarkable and uh i was with him the night he got the human rights guidelines through the un's human right commission i think it was 2011 and uh, he was a very he was a very happy man that night i don't want to get too involved in policy but yes, that's I such understand. a strong a strong a strong you know stake in the ground that's how i see it so how do you um when we're talking about aligning the value chain around a corporate purpose. Uh, how do you make the corporate purpose front and center? And the corporate purpose would be guided by the values that uh, you have just referred to, human rights and human dignity. How do you uh, do you use corporate purpose as a tool 
to attract investment? Do you use corporate purpose to um, rally artisanal miners to join uh, a, a specific initiative? What is the role of purpose in organizing and optimizing the value chain? And I'm thinking of the entire ecosystem uh, so, that would exist. So when we talk about corporate purpose, it's important to differentiate for a second large mining shops versus artisanal miners. Yeah. So, so large mining shops, by definition, projects happen in remote, potentially underdeveloped places. Artisanal miners coexist on land concessions and their extensions of communities. And communities have the potential to shut down the large project full stop. We've mm -hmm. seen that. Like, look at La La Las Bambas or Tia Maria, the big projects in Peru, let's say, where mm -hmm. there's been conflict, including artisanal mining uh, related, that's led to uh, shut, shut down some active violence. So at a starting point, it's about community engagement. It's about respect. It's about the flexibility to take time to understand, build solutions that make win-win sense. Artisanal miners are a subset of that because by definition, they're, they're coexisting on the land concession. They came out of that community. So they can either be ignored or engaged. Ignored mm -hmm. means conflict. It means legal risk and PR risk. Engaged means mutual value and productivity. So it's smart business and encapsulate what's smart in the context of purpose because it's also right, makes a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Then in the context of artisanal miners itself, well, there are no pre-existing corporations. These these folks are onesies, twosies on the ground. They're, they're at the bottom of economic hierarchies in most countries, but the active organization needs to be principles driven. And those principles are all around, like Paul said, lead with human rights driven towards dignity, driven towards productivity, driven towards approaches that make sense all up and down the, the, the value chain. So you combine those two things, the, 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 the smart and the right at the large company level and the principles that apply at an ASM level, and you've got the groundwork for a common conversation that's geared towards mutual value and collaboration. So I'm going to ask some questions that I think you might be surprised to receive. So let's go through a <laughs> hypothetical situation. I, I actually, my grandfather uh, was a miner, but uh, he, not a miner, he owned mineral rights. He, he would actually, uh, it was in the depression in the United States, and he would um, obtain mineral rights in exchange for a service. He had no interest in owning the land. He wanted mineral rights, and he amassed a, a very large uh, collection of mineral rights. Uh, so I have a little more familiarity, and there was a time when uh, my family was looking at mining lignite on some of the family property in the, in back in those days. That's all gone. I got rid of that <laughs> because uh, it was too complicated to manage. So I have a little more familiarity than you might realize. So let's say that I came to you <clears throat> with capital and I said, Rob and Pete, I'm interested in starting an entity uh, that will um, partner with large miners, but I have a new tech, new technology that I can get more value out of artisanal miners uh, than legacy large mining corporations. And um, I, I want to take advantage of public support uh, including funding and, and other infrastructure support and combinations of private. How would I go about it? Where would I incorporate my company? Would my board um, would my board have government officials on it or uh, representatives of the government? Who would be on my board? How would we organize? And is there some charter I would have that shows my purpose? I I'm trying to walk through a hypothetical that might help it make make it more concrete in terms of the role of purpose in organizing the value chain. So I can't say where you should incorporate it because devil's in the details and there are so many places where mining happens, of course, as a starting point. But, but I will say, number one, 
There's a whole lot of opportunities to apply technology, including innovative technology in, um, in, in artisanal mining to change the game around productivity as well as safety. One example is around mercury elimination, which is a scourge in gold mining with communities, the water table, the, the, the soil and the miners themselves all being um, contaminated. And it does it does horrible things to people. So, so there's opportunities to make that go away. There's innovative bio leaching. So there are opportunities in terms of how do you, how do you organize? Well, of course you bring relevant expertise to a board and of course you set it up relative to the purpose and the goal that you're trying to drive. So if, if we're talking about innovative technologies around their artisanal mining, then do you need, do you, do you need experts around the technology or around responsible mining or around the geopolitical or legal implications of that? Well, Probably yes. So 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 the board gets formed accordingly, and just like any other business, it starts to function based on the mix of uh, capabilities that it needs. Paul, yeah. Look, it's an incredibly challenging question. Um, so I would unpick it in this way. Um, so you're coming with a technology. You want to make return. You perhaps want to improve the social and environmental con conditions around the operation. Yeah, that's clear. Right. I, I think one of the things here is that the, the point of purpose in some ways in that context, you need to start at the very end of the chain and ask the question, what value do we want to leave behind? Okay. Mm -hmm. So as a, a mining entity that is in the game for profit, and setting up wherever you set up, whatever structure makes sense. The best insurance I think you can buy is by ensuring there is proper value creation embedded in the mining community. And that has so often not been the, the point in the past. I think traditionally, and certainly for the last, I don't know, X many decades, you know, if you take take big mining entities yes there's some good deeds and there's good examples and there's good case studies but we so often look down the value chain to manage risk right so whether you're headquartered in in johannesburg or new york or you're listed in toronto that instinct is to look down the value chain the best insurance you can buy as a new entity is start at the very end point of the value chain and look up it and i think that's the difference between look i'm i'm not criticizing extractive capitalism that's we've had that model for 250 years it's benefited huge numbers of people but a very small fraction of humanity we need to transition from extractive to regenerative part of the regenerative is that you look after the originators of the community and i think that's where the multinational instinct has so often failed in the past it's your best possible insurance is buying in the community by leaving value behind and it's not just income it is it's you know it's the sanitation it's the lighting it's the basic services edu education and it's not as a showcase example which goes away after the mines closed because mines are finite it mm -hmm. is actually part of the fabric of the community and look just maybe as a, a really direct example so a gems miner out of nairobi who i know um lebanese gentleman who's had uh, a mine up near the ugandan border both for gems and gold for 30 40 years without any of the jargon of esg or sustainability he he put it on a plate said look once you lose the community and you're not leaving the value behind you've lost the mine effectively and you'll get conflict his biggest concern in terms of his mining operation was the the new ugandan fine where they reckon i don't know they say 13 trillion dollars of gold his vein abuts that on the ugandan border he sees that level of uh find will only create conflict right unless people look at it in a different way so on the purpose i i don't think we no longer have the ability to not have pur purpose which is authentic there's simply too much capability to monitor to look 
all of those things that you, you can no longer get away with not leaving enough value in the community. And that's only going to propel. I, I hope, again, it's generic, but that's that's my 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 sense. Really challenging question. I mean, I, I was glad Rob came in because I had no answer. And I, I don't know if I've given one, but there you go. No, it's, it's a discussion. I don't think I didn't. I don't really <laughs> expect an answer. I know it's complex. I'm using questions to pull the discussion so it's not a, a got you question it's you know a, listen I, I, I keep them coming because it makes yeah. it much more interesting discussion yeah. you know that i'm um, rob knows that and james it. and plus for our audience and the people who will watch the recording because uh, a lot of people are are not able to attend live mm-hmm. yep got you so i'm gonna say what paul just said a, a second ago is the fundamental point around uh, purpose in mining because I've, I've had a number of people tell me well what does regenerative mean in the context of mining when you're literally extracting something from the ground and so yeah fair enough you're not going to regenerate that cobalt that you're you're digging out of the ground however what regenerative means is that you're going to collaborate with the community take a community-centric approach and generate long-term sustainable win-win value so that and what he said is fundamentally the point that we're getting at you've either got win-win value or in the fullness of time you've got lose-lose uh conflict yep. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I certainly know of an example, and I I actually cannot give all the, the detail all of the details because it was with a law firm uh, that was a customer of mine. But uh, there was a uh, a country, uh, let's just say in an in in on the Asian continent that was uh, conducting mining through a state owned company in uh, a Latin American country, and uh, due to the uh, lack of cultural understanding um, and uh, a lack of understanding of the laws, there was great hostility between the miners and the management and the miners kidnapped the management yeah. and held them hostage. And so I there are very concrete examples of um, of the conflict when you talked about you basically lose the mine if you don't engage the community. And um, uh, I'm curious also, let's say that I am a customer of um, of um, the fruits of mining. So we've talked about gold and cobalt. I can think of many other minerals uh, that would be of interest, but let's just use gold or cobalt. So there's a supply chain for gold, you know, acquiring it, processing it, and productizing it in jewelry. Um, to what extent does the regenerative intent and uh, purpose for the community affect the value, uh, all parts of the value chain. Uh, For example, if I go buy gold jewelry, or I buy a product that, you know, technology product that requires gold, uh, you know, do do, uh, the end users and customers care about what happens with the artisanal mining community uh is purpose is the entire value chain so connected that um the end user or end consumer uh is going to make consumption decisions or does that not play a role it's changing so Mm -hmm. so first before before addressing the question you mentioned the person who was kidnapped in the community conflict because of cross-cultural understanding that's all too common and one of the disciplines that we're talking about that's baked in strategically based on purpose is to engage a culture on its own terms acknowledge history on its own terms Mm -hmm. engage people on their own terms and that takes time and effort to develop and it's it's sorely lacking some time now going to your actual question Mm -hmm. um it, it's evolving. We live in a world of social media. The truth is out. And what, what, what happens when it's positive ends up on Facebook? What happens when it's negative ends up, guess what, on Facebook? So reputational risks are very real. 
and along with reputational risks, there 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 are business risks because where there's conflict, there isn't stable supply or stable price. So by definition, whether you're a, a watchmaker using gold or the Ford Motor Company using nickel, you 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 could be stopped in your tracks because you don't have the mineral you need to uh, build the product that you want to be that you want built. So there is an understanding, which is very important that's emergent, mm -hmm. that there's huge reputational risk that comes with all of this. Because at the end of the day, if you're if you're an OEM or if you're a cell phone maker or if you're a jeweler, let's say, use, putting gold that included slave labor and it's mining in your watch, and the truth outs around that, well, the people who are paying five or ten or fifteen thousand dollars for that top end watch mm -hmm. aren't going to feel good about that. So that can impact your brand. That can impact your long term viability as a business, which 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 is a shift from the past. Because in the past there wasn't a massive likelihood that the truth will be out. But as that becomes more likely, it's it, it's gotten there. Paul. Yeah. Look, three. Let me call them tabloid points jumping across different minerals um, and, and some a little bit anecdotal. Uh, so there's a, a, a smallest jewelry operation in Amsterdam, which I think has been in place for 30 years. And the uh, the sign on the shop door is um, from the mine to your finger. Right. And um, and interestingly, my son, who is in Amsterdam, you know, went and had a chat and he was really impressed with the I think it's a family business but how seriously they genuinely took over that 30 years, you know, knowing the minds that it came from. That, that's just a bit of color. I think the second point that I'd want to make is that it's to re reiterate uh, Rob's point is that the, the, the ability to, to blow a brand, which is hugely valuable. Okay. Um, and let's, let's think about maybe some of the Swiss watch brands. Um, let's think about some of the ultra high net worth luxury goods where prestige and provenance is everything. Uh, I was in a meeting last week where um, someone from someone really, really clever and articulate with De Beers said that um, future luxury is transparency, right? Mm -hmm. So let me connect the dots. The um, we know, I think, and Rob will correct me if I'm wrong, but at some point, in some way, shape or form, whether it's physically or transactionally, 70% of the world's gold supply goes through Switzerland. Now, that's whether it's on a trading platform or it's physical. And I think 2022, it's 4,750 tonnes of gold was produced of that 20% artisanal miners. Okay. Now, the, the ability going forward for the the various brands, the Rolexes, the Chopard, the Breguet, all of that, to connect themselves to, let's call it, new gold, where the provenance is clean, and that's going to be really difficult. That is, on, on the liability side, to get that wrong, that's huge. Mm -hmm. On the plus side, to be able to differentiate yourself as a brand, that's even bigger. Because, um, again, the same person from De Beers made the point, which was really interesting. That's on the diamond side, obviously, was that, you know, big expenditure on luxury goods is not only by the ultra high net worth and high net worth. It can be special events in people's families. It can be the grandparents saving up, you know, who've, who've got enough and they want a special event. So I think to reiterate, it's not going to be solved overnight, but because of that, the level of connectivity and the level of understanding and also the distrust of the next generation. If you were born in 2000, you're now 22 or 23, and you know, you've know you been through the global financial crash, you've got climate change, you've got pandemics, what, why do you trust people? And I think we're going to see a decade of authenticity and more. I would hope that. And that relates to what you put on your body or on your finger or how you think about the provenance and look it's a bit touchy-feely psycho a psycho babble but I, I believe that's true the third point for me in terms of um the 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 the, the mining value chain and this is a question rather than answering it is people in multinationals in terms of the level of return you expect in terms of the level of C-suite 
privilege. And I'm a card carrying capitalist. Is there a point that in terms of leaving more value behind in the value chain, do we have to expect less in the G7 and the G20 and the developed countries? Do we have to expect less in terms of reward? The inequality now is so manifest and transparent. Um, And let me finish this off before I I go on too long. Look, I've just come back from 10 days embedded with the Brazilian federal police. And I mean embedded. We were Mm -hmm. looking at illegal mining, human trafficking, sex trafficking, um, deforestation, and illegal use of land. That's what we were looking at. Brazilian federal police, incredible. At the heart of their model now, it's not just about prosecution. It's about the fact that they at the top see social inequality as the, as the spark that lights the blue touch paper for any of the crimes above, right? So I, I think the point there is massive shifts in terms of trust, in terms of authenticity, and brands are exposed. You don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Yes, and I would yeah. like to know one of the... Uh, uh, areas I like to explore is that those types of pressures ultimately influence directors' fiduciary duties. Even though those are not under law, the beneficiaries of fiduciary duties, but they are stakeholders, and in their stakeholder role, will ultimately influence the legal and regulatory system affecting fiduciary duties. Rob, I think you were going to say something. So- yeah, I was just going to add a thought to uh, what Paul said. And so transparency, is it a human right? Arguably. And if it's a human right in the world of mining, does it mean traceability? Well, de- 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 definitely. And does that get you a place that's like Intel inside? So you think about Intel and those little chips and how they differentiated themselves for years and years. We all know the phrase, they made money because of it. So in the context of transparency, which is a human right, is there an equivalent responsible inside if you're Chopar or Rolex? And if responsible inside makes you more money because it lowers your risk and it improves your market attractiveness, then there's a value proposition that's commercially logical that goes along with that. And that's something that maybe day to day at a C-suite level isn't isn't the crisis of the day conversation. But you think about true governance and long term strategic intent. There's a an, an, an obvious natural fit for that conversation as being fundamental. Look on on the fiduciary duty, John. To to to, to add to what Rob said and, and your question, um, if I go, if I go back in two thousand and three. Um, when I was in the UN, as we developed ESG, we commissioned a legal interpretation from Freshfields. And they looked at ESG in the context of fiduciary duty in the nine major capital markets. If we didn't have that legal interpretation in terms of the fundamental thing was, do, does fiduciary duty shift over time if public policy changes? And the legal interpretation, you know, c- done by the late Professor Paul Watchman, who sadly has just just passed a couple of months ago, was fundamental in that it said, in the context of the law as it stands now, in these capital markets, yes, as as public policy shifts, and we're seeing that shift around environmental and social issues all the time, fiduciary duty also does shift. It's dynamic. It's not stationary. Now, the idea that fiduciary duty is simply connected to you know, efficient market theory, shareholder maximization, profit optimization. I think that's that is now in the rear view mirror. There's lots of people who will argue it, but to answer your question in terms of a mining company looking at their fiduciary duties and their ability to manage risks down their supply chain, that has changed and it will never come back. Look at the prudential oversight bodies. We're not talking about environment ministries now. We're talking about the Bank for International Settlements, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, IOSCO, the insurers. They're all beginning to build these connectors to systemic risk and portfolio risk and operational risk into their their protocols. That's what's changing the game. I have another question. So in the United States, we have an academic forum called the Harvard Corporate Governance Forum. And it is just one example 
of academically affiliated forums on a particular governance issue. There are other, uh, uh, it's usually associated with a law school or an MBA school. And I think Stanford has a one on artificial intelligence. Is there anywhere in the world uh, that where there is an academically led but not necessarily dominated uh, forum or group of scholars and business people and policy persons who can explore these issues in greater depth, a little bit independently of profit, come up with scholarship and recommendations. That's one of the big advantages of the Harvard Corporate Governance Forum. Does that exist anywhere in the world that you can leverage? in an evolving way. So there's pockets of capabilities. A professor here, a small team in the other university, standard setters in the ICMM, in uh, the Mining Association of Canada, so on. It, but, but, but there isn't an overarching equivalent to the Harvard Business School, let's say, that brings it all together. And that's something that will change because the industry itself is changing and there's a realization that there needs to be a broad-based academic theoretical focus mm -hmm. on what is regenerative approaches look like over the course of time. So so to me, that's positive that at least people are talking about it as a first step towards solving the problem. Look, I would add uh, the the sort of the, the, the obvious two in the UK sense are Cambridge and Oxford. If you look at the... Um, Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, which Dame Polly Cortis ran for decades. If you look at what's happening in um, in the Oxford context in terms of looking at sustainability, looking at specifics of ESG from a governance standpoint, I think there's some brilliant work underway. And I, you know, I'm not UK biased. I think there's other pods of leadership in in uni universities also outside of the um, um, you know the G7 and the OECD countries. I think th I think there's really interesting work going on. We just might not have you know heard about it, but that focus is is um, the, the governance. The governance piece is fundamental to everything. We know that, and um, I think there's a, a revolution in governance thinking, and it's both at the systemic level, capital market, and the operational level, and and that's about the 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 shift to you know the regenerative form of capitalism. Yes, and I would like to note in our remaining 10 minutes, uh, we have a guest, Felix Bracco. And uh, Felix, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to use our chat feature or unmute. We would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, I, I would just like to note, uh, you might consider starting a partnership with uh, a law school or an MBA school or a mining uh, a school that an engineering school uh, where that can bring uh, the business community, government policy experts, the legal experts, and actual uh, business people, and bring them together where they can discuss issues in a neutral forum uh, to prepare for the future. It could be focused on regenerative governance and commerce, or it could be focused on mining. I, I have another question. Uh, I have visited several countries. Uh, I usually meet with the legal community or I will lecture at a law school. Uh, and I, I visited several countries that are former colonial possessions. And, um, and one of the things they observe is that today they believe they are being and I'm not going to name the countries, but um, uh, they I have visited with uh, some very high level people and they believe that they are being recolonized, but this time by corporations and uh, the uh, multinationals essentially pay off government uh, to uh, supply a labor force uh, to the multinationals. And they there are examples of this in mining. And um, they just believe it's, uh, uh, some of them use the word neo-colonialism. And um, I just wonder if, if you are able to address this dynamic. This, the country in, in particular that I visited, spent one month in, uh, has a lot of mining of gems for the jewelry industry. It, it, it's, it's real. So, so, so let's be real. We know there's bribery. We, yeah. we, we know there are specific examples in the last few years that have led to massive nine-figure fines around bribery. 
we we know there's many other examples that haven't gone public. We know there's more subtle forms as well. So so so, so it's real. We also know that there's that there, there, there's some companies that are really good at focusing culturally and engaging locally. There are others who are less good at it and they'll go through the community instead of collaborating with the community, resulting in inevitable conflict, but it's a form of neo-colonialism. So, so, so it definitely exists. Mm -hmm. And when you think about artisanal mining in particular, there's also, in some cases, a bit of a white savior mentality where, you know, I, I, I'm from the West and I'm here to help because I know better. And I mean, I, I am from the West and I'm a, I'm a white male, but I don't know better is, is, is my first comment. And the reason I don't know better is it starts with the local culture. So both of those things are real, but again, with enhanced transparency the, and, and, and the need to grow a tonnage exponentially given the, the energy transition, it, it's changing. I, I think there's a contextual piece, which is sort of, is the last 40 years just which is in in a period where we've seen deregulation liberalization free trade and actually more importantly than anything else is the financialization of the world the the ability for the money to cross borders from powerful institutions and a lack of a new governance model uh, and doesn't have to be a controlling model, but a, a governance model in terms of, um, you know, looking at that and understanding the flows and actually providing the appropriate governance at the multilateral or the regional or the state level. I think that plays into it. So it's 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 not necessarily malfeasance. It's just the evolution of fast flow capital without an effective governance model around it. L let me land that with one example. So um, in northern Brazil, there's a, I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong, but there's a, a city called uh, Alto Tumcan, which is at the epicenter of the uh, illegal gold mining, uh, which is going on in and around the Amazon. And that really took off in 2013. Now, there is both organized crime. The Brazilian federal police receive 59,000 illegal mining alerts a year, right? And that's now connected to a very sophisticated satellite system. Okay, fine. That's the picture. Some of the money behind that illegal gold mining is not organized crime. It's external investors from the US and from Europe who are, should we say, winging it or playing it loose and there's so much money to be made simply because the price point of gold, once it gets to the market, um, and so little is left behind in terms of vulnerable communities. So to, to conflate the two points, there's a contextual piece in terms of where the markets and, and global financialization has gone, the lack of a governance structure at the G7, G20, beyond that, and the ability for either illegitimate cash and funds or legitimate cash and funds to come into illegal entities. That's really complex, but it's happening. So the the, the federal police, one of the conversations was 2013, the, there were issues, but there wasn't the explosion. And that's new money coming into it, both from a, a criminal standpoint, but then just investors who see it as a legitimate take. Um, I, I'll leave it at that. And, and if anyone has questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. And just all you have to do is unmute yourself. Felix, do you have any? We are delighted you are here. Thank you for joining us. Do you have any questions or comments? Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Felix from Ghana. And I've been enjoying the conversation so far. What really resonates with me is something uh, Rob said. But usually initiatives coming in and they don't try to understand what the miners are going through. It's like, hey, I'm here. I know better. Yeah. And with their respect bit too. So I think with uh, proper integration of ASM, 
we really have to know what they are going through. We really have to understand their their concerns before we we come into uh, let's say we are the Calvary. We are here to save. So I, I I'm I'm very delighted with the conversation so far. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. I appreciate it. So, yes. Felix, do you have any uh, good uh, examples of successes in your country in the mining context where companies are um, fulfilling the goals you've just expressed? So what you usually have is there seems to be a, a, a dichotomy between the ASM and then the last scale miners. It's like the last scale miners really don't want to have anything to do with the ASM. And mm. then when you come to the artisanal miners to the issue of even licensing, because there will be a license will be given at the capital, and yet the where the mining is going to be done, less engagement is done. So they are there, and then people just come. We have the license to mine here. And repeatedly, it's, it's become a problem. There are initiatives going on. So uh, somewhere last year, the government uh, supplied some uh, gold uh, machines, what they call the gold catcher trying to eliminate or reduce mercury use. And it, it's kind of hit a snag because it, it's not a technology they really like to use. So you ask yourself, really what went into it? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the challenges. But all in all, uh, there are improvements being made, but there are there's much room for improvements yeah felix i've just uh i've just followed you on linkedin so it's nice to be in touch but you're thank you you're, thank you, you i will you, follow you also i will you, find you on linkedin and follow you your so, comments thank are, you. your comments are immensely valuable and you know we 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 um we came at it very humbly but we took quite a, a deep dive look at some of the should we say the political and the community problems in the context of the i think it's the gamma say in in the Ghanaian. if that word is i pronounce it correctly yeah, but thank you thank, yeah thank you for your comments um really appreciate thank it. you too i really appreciate it thanks felix. i just sent you an invite to connect felix on linkedin okay thank you i would accept so sure. i have a I have a question now. If it, if it, if anyone else has a question, please interrupt me because your questions and comments are more important than mine. But I, I have a question that I think will shock you. But uh, there's a former CIA analyst. I, who's uh, he publishes uh, a lot of content, some of which covers mining. Not only that, but um, very famous. And one of the observations he made is that due to the complexity of regulation in uh, on the planet Earth and due to all of the environmental concerns, uh, the one of the motivations for commercial space exploration is to replace mining on the Earth with mining in space. And of course, the, the economics don't work out yet, but it does look like um uh the economics over time will change at least for some of the highest value uh mining products of course i'm i'm not familiar with them so please know i'm only repeating what i've read and listened to and studied i don't understand it but i'm curious uh do you hear any efforts uh to explore this or is this unrealistic and it's a dream and not realistic at all don let me jump in first simply cuz one of my um, it was originally a, an intern in the UN. This was 20 plus years ago. The gentleman, Jacob Molkhouse, 
who absolutely brilliant, brilliant mind in his early 20s. He was one of the key team behind ESG and these principles. He's now the executive director of the Open Lunar Society out of Washington. And um, so he's familiarized myself with the importance of governance in space. Yes. And um, and I, th- I think, you know, the sooner we start that conversation in a meaningful way, way which they have, and I know there's various bodies doing it, but I, I think you're absolutely right. It's not that it might be far off technically, but it's not that far off in the the mind of people who think there's money to be made, uh, you know, in space. And we shouldn't just because space is big, we shouldn't make the same problems we made in uh, in uh, on the Earth. I, it's a look; it's a flippant comment, but I, yeah. I am certainly aware of those issues. And, and Jacob's work is just first rate. Uh, Rob, over to you to make some sense. Yeah, yeah no, I mean exactly. It, it's the f- the future is coming. And now's the time to think about what does uh, governance in that context look like, even, e- even though it won't be this decade. There's also conversations around seabed mining and what are the risks and opportunities there. And again, there's potentially catastrophic environmental and uh, ecological uh, risks. So, so eyes need to be wide open if and as that's approached. But, 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 but in the meantime, we need to think about multiple time horizons. And engaging appropriately today, where where stake where obviously mining is about geology and engineering at a certain level, but but communities and broader stakeholders are king because they can make or break projects, and artisanal miners are fundamental to uh, that picture. So e- e- even as we get more robust there, we've got to think about the future. John, can I add a point just very briefly? Please. Look, my I I guess my sort of journey into environmentalism started back in the the or sustainability back in the late 80s and it was through the lens of something called the uh, the antarctic treaty which mm-hmm. was formed between 30, 39 nations in 1959 in the year of uh, uh, geophysics and why i'm saying that was between 89 and 91 they uh, negotiated the antarctic environmental protection regime and that was a closed diplomatic process. All of the seven sisters, the big fossil fuel companies were there present. I was at eight, each of the negotiations. Um, and, um, you know, so Antarctica is protected until 2042 mm-hmm. um, when the treaty, the environmental protection protocol is up for renewal, tw- 42 to 48. If we're in a position where we're arguing over mineral rights, fossil fuels and coal, which there's a fair bet is under Antarctica, we have really distinct problems. So that's that's a firm date in the diary that if, uh, you know, if um, if if God is willing, I'd love to get to 2042 to uh, to be back in that va- battle 50, 50 years on after the original treaty was confirmed. Uh, and it is all about minerals. And, you know, we do not want to be there as a planet. Well, I've certainly heard some people... I've heard, I've heard some people say... Um, Indeed, uh, we're looking forward to the glaciers melting because that will make it much cheaper to do the mining we want to do as well as the transportation. So that uh, that notion does exist uh, for sure. Felix, I think you have a comment or question. Yes, I, I think once there's money to be made, uh, we we need to start that conversation now, yes. because like uh, John said, now we are we are looking at going to get some fossil fuels. So whatever be the case, people will look at going to mine in space. So I think that conversation has to start now. And then we look at the shortcomings or the mistakes we've done here on Earth. So we don't repeat it once we go up there. So that conversation has to start now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Felix, very much. Um, well, we've reached the, it's time to start winding down. We've actually gone a little over time, and I thank everyone for staying with us. It's been a very enriching conversation. I would like to invite uh, Rob and Paul to come back and uh, engage again, go deeper into the topic, and we can go out, uh, at a later date, organize that and have a meeting to organize the topics. Are there any remaining questions? Are there issues or that or questions you wish I had asked or issues that uh, anyone thinks I should have raised but did not or any other final thoughts or comments before we sign off. 
Maybe just the last word and then I'll pass it over to Paul. Um, so obviously at a basic level, mining is about geology and engineering or bodies are king, but the real kings are communities because mm -hmm. they can make or break uh, the project full stop. Mm -hmm. so, so, so what we're talking about here, engagement with communities, engagement with uh, artisanal miners that share land concessions, engagement with indigenous nations, and incidentally, 54% of critical mineral projects are on indigenous lands, is fundamental to the future of the industry, f f f figuring that out. It's about dignity, it's about productivity, it's about value at, at the last mile all the way through to uh, the value chain, all the way down the value chain. And transparency is going to be a key enabler to that, like we said. So the more we think in those terms, the uh, more effective, I believe, we're going to be at driving the fundamental change that's now in progress. Mm -hmm. and, and John, from, from my standpoint, Rob, Rob and myself and, and some other, you know, genuine um, and deep ex expertise and experience uh, have been invited to the United Nations World Investment Forum. That's the UNCTAD event in Abu Dhabi, October 18th, 21st, where we're doing a, a session on strategic minerals. And um, part of that will be, you know, uh, presenting what Rob has described in terms of, I see it as, you know, four steps. It's, if you're going to get productivity and mining right, you need to, at the same time, empower the community, the ability to enhance traceability around uh, provenance and that direct mining, mine to refinery is beginning to come into play because of companies like and this is not an advert, but, you know, it's one of our partners, BankQ, on the, the ability to use technologies to enhance traceability. And and more important than anything else, as Rob said, you know, in, in the the, the um, sort of uh, the prescience of the late Professor John Ruggie was start with human rights and you'll be kept straight. Whether that's where you're a big miner or you're a medium sized miner or you're a regulator, that the ability to understand, as Felix had said, understand the communities and build out from there. Mm -hmm. Don't just go down the value chain and tick risk boxes. Actually make, make value creation part of your business model. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Felix, thank you for joining us. I look forward to the next time. It's time to co conclude our webinar today, but I've so enjoyed it. And I have a many, many questions and issues I hope to explore in the future. Thank you very much, Rob and Paul, for your time. Yeah. John, not a, not a problem. It was a delight to join the Bonner Institute. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.